to get started. So welcome to everybody for joining us today for accessibility and metadata, the critical connection. Uh, we're uh, featuring three uh, good friends and uh, active members of our workflow committee, um, uh, including uh, Rachel Comerford, Jillian Hetzler, and Aaron Lucas. If we go to the next slide, uh, I'll introduce them formally. Thanks. Rachel is Senior Director of Content Standards and Accessibility for Macmillan Learning. Um, she's uh, chair, also chair of our uh, workflow committee, uh, has been for the last year, and uh, has a, uh, a, a both a perspective and a, and a significant role in accessibility at Macmillan. Uh, Jillian is Director of Content and Library per Partnerships at Benetech. We'll talk a little bit about Benetech in a couple minutes, but uh, uh, Jillian joins us from the West Coast, where it is morning, and Aaron from the Midwest, where it is just barely afternoon. And Aaron Lucas is Senior Director of Digital Accessibility at Red Shell. Welcome and thanks for being part of today's conversation. Uh, we're going to have, uh, we've actually scheduled this for up to 90 minutes, um, but uh, what we have is uh, actually a presentation that will lead into a discussion presentation itself will try to address several different questions. The first of which is, what is accessibility metadata and why is it critical for accessible content? Because uh, we think there's an important argument to be made there. We'll talk about schema.org and Onyx, two different ways to provide accessibility metadata <clears throat> for digital products. Um, we'll talk about workflows. This is a critical piece of the puzzle. Workflows publishers can adopt to create uh, and manage accessibility metadata. And then we'll also talk about how that metadata moves from publishers to trading partners and what trading partners do with metadata. We have a couple of different case studies of successful metadata implementations, and we'd love to hear from you if you have something that you'd like to share. Uh, put it in either the chat or the Q&A and we'll see if we can't get into a discussion. We'll initially follow with a discussion uh, in, uh, among the panelists, but then uh, specifically address any questions you might have I put a note in the uh, chat that if you have any questions, add them to the Q&A box. It's on the right side of the control panel, typically at the bottom of the page that you're looking at. Uh, it's a good way for us to keep track of it. The Q&A box is better than chat for the purposes of identifying questions because they stay, they stay in front of us, whereas the chat kind of rolls and it's a lot easier to keep track of them. So if you could use the Q&A, that would be helpful. We have a, a, a handful of polls set up that we might invoke during the, um, the course of the presentation. And that'll give <clears throat> both the, the four of us as panelists and the audience as a whole, a sense of how those who've come today to this webinar uh, are doing with respect to accessibility and metadata about accessible products. So, so with that, I think we can uh, kick things off. Rachel, could you remind me, does it fall to me to talk about terms and definitions? It does fall to you to talk about terms and definitions. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we wanted to at least, we're gonna talk about several things today in, in probably multiple times. So we wanted to provide a little bit of background on both some organizations and some acronyms that are commonly used in the accessibility universe. Uh, DAISY is an organization that provides support for accessible publishing and reading services and does a lot across the uh, industry to uh, provide accessible structures for digital publications. Uh, Benetech, which is Jillian's organization, is a nonprofit that develops software for social good. Their mandate is uh, broader than accessibility alone, uh, although Jillian, your role is, is fundamentally accessibility. Uh, and they have multiple program areas and initiatives that provide software to improve the lives of people across the world. Uh, WCAG uh, is the acronym for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, they're part of a series of, of guidelines that are published by the, the, part the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, which is the main international standards organization for the internet. SEO, we refer to search engine optimization. This is probably pretty well known, uh, but we do talk about it a little bit, particularly with respect to the use of schema.org. Uh, and DSO refers to disability services offices, which are typically uh, departments within higher education settings that serve the needs of students, um, uh, including in the area of, of accessibility for and access to digi digital content. 
And if we have any other acronyms that we missed for this list, tell us in the chat and we'll definitely, um, we'll add them to the list. All right, thank you so much, Brian. So the first question that we wanted to answer was the biggest one, which is what is accessibility metadata? Um, in brief, it provides information to users about the accessible features of a piece of content. So the list of metadata tags is significant um, and probably doesn't make for a great webinar unless James Earl Jones is reading it. But it includes elements like the table of contents navigation um, and identifies if there are alternative descriptions or accessible map. Um, so we have two types of accessibility metadata to focus on today. One is Onyx and the other is schema.org. Uh, and Jillian, can you tell us a little bit about why accessibility metadata is important? I would love to. So um, one of the first reasons that this particular type of metadata is important is because on one hand, it benefits those who have disabilities, whether they need uh, to use a screen reader, maybe they're blind, maybe they need to use a app that um, has, um, you know, the benefit of highlighting because they have, you know, a learning disability like dyslexia. Um, and so there's a number of features that individuals with disabilities that would need to take advantage of. Um, and it helps to make it just easier for them to know, is your book usable to them? Um, but of course, it's not just people with disabilities. So there's what we call situational disabilities. So if say you are driving and need to be hands-free, then having um, say, being able to take advantage of say text-to-speech um, could be really useful to just have say, um, a your, your book being read out loud to you. Or, you know, if once again, the, I always love this example of like if you're in an airport because maybe some of you are traveling these days, um, and closed captions uh, are, are um, or you know, if you're in the subway or whatever it might be. So it's not just for this, um, you know, specific population. Like we all kind, we all here have been in scenarios where we have these situ situational disabilities, and knowing that these products would benefit those um, situations is just really helpful as well. Um, one one thing to keep in mind is that. Uh, accessibility support um, does vary by by product and publisher. Um, so there are different types of features that can be put in. Um, and just because something could be put in doesn't mean that it is. And so having that kind of called out specifically on, say, a product page um, really just helps make that uh, kind of purchasing decision a little bit a little bit easier um, from, from the get-go. The way things work today is that, say, if I want to know if this book will be, say, compatible on my screen reader or um, some other AT device, I essentially have to buy the book, open it up, and then see if I can read it. It's like the equivalent of buying a book. Well, this may happen to you if you buy a book used and then you realize all the pages inside are turned out, you know, uh, torn out. It's frustrating, it's, it's angry making, it doesn't really make you wanna go back and, and buy more from whether it be that, um, you know, that publisher, that uh, retailer, whatever it may be. Um, so, so that's just like kind of keeping in mind what, you know, how can we improve um, the user experience for, for these, uh, these folks? Um, and just to give a, an audience size um, for those of you who haven't heard some of these numbers before. Um, if you think of the number of uh, people who have red hair in the in the world, um, there are there are more blind people than people who have red hair. Um, and then if you think of people who are are left handed, I, I myself are right handy, uh, for those of you who who care, um, there are more people with learning disabilities than there are those who are lefties. So it's not, this isn't like a insubstantial number here. And I think it is easy to think like, oh, if like, I don't personally know someone who has, um, who has kind of this more visible disability, just know that there are, there are probably people, you know, who would um, like to take advantage of this, even if you weren't aware of it. So, 
Um, of course, you know, it's not just about the content itself and what the publishers do. The reading platforms make a difference as well. Um, you know, it notes here, reading platforms can support only features that are included. Um, and also not all reading platforms support all, all features. So uh, generally reading systems won't expose features that they don't support, um, but it's good to kind of know that, you know, does this book have say, um, you know, uh, interactive, interactive media elements? Is there, you know, accessible math involved? Um, and that way, um, you know, it's a little bit more clear also to the reading system too. Like, is this something that we need, want to expose or not um, on, that, on that level? Um, another thing to keep in mind is that as a, to, to Rachel's point, there's a lot of these accessibility uh, <laughs> metadata items and it can, it can be complex. Um, and essentially by, by exposing them, you put the onus on the user. They know what they need. You don't need to make that decision for them. Um, and that way, you know, also keeping in mind, there's a huge range of disability types that someone would need to keep in mind um, when accessing a book and many different types of scenarios. And so once again, the individual knows what they need for, for their given reading experience. And it might be completely different from someone else um, next to them as well. So something to, to keep in mind. Um, and then, and then of course the last one comes down to, uh, to sales. You know, if it's not clear that a book will work for a person, um, I mentioned already that kind of like horrible user experience of, you know, essentially opening a book and realize that you can't use it. It's terrible. And so the default is to not purchase. It's not to, okay, I'm, you know, super masochistic and want to just keep doing this, you know, Sisyphusian task over and over again. Um, and kudos to those who, who do um, kind of mount those barriers. But at the um, end of the day, if someone is like, oh yeah, books like bought on XYZ platform don't work for me, then they usually bother you, the publisher. They go directly to you and say, hey, I need a special format of this book. And you might be like, well, maybe you don't because all this stuff is in here. We spent a lot of time and effort uh, updating our, our uh, you know, EPUB production platforms and we have all these accessibility features. Um, so in theory, if you have done this, they could just buy the book and read it for, uh, for themselves, but they don't necessarily know that if you don't tell them. So, um, yeah, it all, it all goes back to making it as a, I guess, a, a pleasant and user friendly experience as possible for this audience. Um, so, we poll. Also, <laughs> we will have a poll. I, I was gonna add, uh, Jillian, that uh, one of the case studies that um, Rachel's gonna present is what happened in Macmillan Learning when they were able to improve the quality and comprehensiveness of the metadata. To, with respect to complaints and requests uh, that they received uh, at the house. So we wanted to, uh, we have, as I said, we have a, a handful of polls that we wanted to just uh, include throughout the, the discussion today. So this first one is about um, whether or not you're currently creating metadata to describe accessible products. And if um, it's not something that's directly relevant to your work, our good news, we have an option, uh, which is that does not apply to me. But go ahead and start to fill that in. I want to encourage the uh, panelists to do the same. Uh, Rachel, I know you hate when you're shut out. So uh, <laughs> you, have, you, ha you have the ability to- I have me. submitted my answer. Thank you. You're welcome. And we'll give this a minute um, to, uh, um, to wrap because I think people sometimes need a little bit of time. And while we're doing that, Rachel, if you want to go to the next slide. Sure. That'd be fine. Um, so I, I did mention that there are two types of metadata that we're going to talk about. One is schema.org and one is Onyx. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to do is, is uh, dig in a little bit to <clears throat> schema.org and what it is. Um, Brian, how are we doing on poll results? I think we've probably given it about enough time. Um, I can probably publish the results um, with everybody. So at about a third uh, are currently uh, this is encouraging. A third are currently creating metadata to describe accessible products. About a quarter do it sometimes, and a sixth 
uh, don't do it at all. And then uh, a chunk, the balance uh, about a little bit less than a third or it, it's not a directly applicable question. So, so that's pretty encouraging overall. Great. Um, so the first one, the first type of metadata that we're gonna talk about is schema.org. Um, this was developed in a collaborative environment, um, largely with the world's biggest search engines. Um, the goal here was to create and maintain and promote schemas for um, structured data, which is useful for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is, is SEO, as we mentioned before, the search engine optimization. Um, it just makes your content much easier to find on the intertubes. Um, Schema.org can be used to convey accessibility metadata, and that metadata supports WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and one of the things that makes schema.org metadata unique is that it's included inside the EPUB file, along with some Dublin Core metadata. Um, Onyx takes a slightly different approach um, in that the metadata is provided outside of the product. Um, Onyx is an international metadata standard for the book industry. So it's often set as XML. Um, but other formats can be used, including a spreadsheet in some cases. Um, and the accessibility portion of Onyx, which covers a, a whole broad, Onyx covers a whole broad range of um, publishing related material, but the accessibility portion is code list 196. Um, so Brian, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the challenges that are associated with implementing these formats? Uh, before we do that, if you go back a slide, <clears throat> I think there's a poll at the end of that. There is a poll at the end of that that I missed. Um, so we have a yeah. poll about um, how you would describe your accessibility features. Again, and this this does have the uh, option to um, declare that it does not apply to me. And while the poll is in, in the field uh, and folks are responding, uh, you can actually do um, more than one if you provide both Onyx and schema as an example or, or schema and something else. And what we're seeing uh, in the answers to this poll, um, a comparable percentage uh, you're saying that it doesn't apply, but uh, of those responding uh, close to half, 45% are using Onyx for books. Uh, these are not adding to 100 because they're a multiple choice, but about a quarter are using schema and 10% are doing something else, uh, which could be sidecar files and the like. So. Uh, if you wanna comment on what else you're using, uh, feel free to throw that into the chat. Yeah, that'd be great if you could, because uh, we, we can certainly pick that up a little bit. All right, thanks. So I'll talk uh, at this point about uh, challenges and you'll see some of this too in the diagrams that, that follow when we talk about uh, workflows, both within a publisher as well as workflows across the supply chain. So let's start with the first part, which is uh, the workflows for metadata are often managed by people who are not necessarily directly involved with accessibility features. And so you have to have something that allows supports and um, manages communications across functions. And without that kind of, a, without those agreements, that's a real challenge. Um, and both uh, with schema.org and with Onyx, publishers have to develop workflows that uh, create and manage accessibility metadata. It's not like you woke up today and you, you had that workflow set up. You both have to identify what metadata you want to provide, how you're going to collect it, who's responsible for it, if there needs to be quality checking, et cetera, on it. Uh, this is true for metadata more broadly. It's just that accessibility is a relatively new product area and, uh, and building those workflows is not necessarily complete across all, all different houses. The other thing that's needed is uh, having trading partners that accept and process accessibility metadata. You can create all the descriptions you want in the world, but uh, if your trading partners are uh, either not accepting it or accepting it and not displaying it, it's not going to go anywhere. The the people who need to know about it, uh, whether they're retailers or individual customers, are not going to be able to get access to the metadata itself. Um, 
And it, it's also the case that you have to determine uh, which metadata takes precedent when multiple forms are offered. Uh, Aaron can probably talk a little bit about this uh, when we get the opportunity, but in effect, if you're providing uh, both data from inside the file using SEO uh, or schema.org and outside the file using Onyx, which do you trust, which is more complete? How do you follow it? And we'll talk a little bit about the uh, multiple sources for metadata when we do the supply chain trading partner diagram in a minute. Um, there are some helpful resources that are available to understand how metadata resources relate to each other. Um, we usually call these maps or crosswalks. Um, I uh, will exit the presentation for just a moment so I can share some of these with you. So the um, accessibility metadata project is one of these. Um, this is um, uh, managed by the by Benetech um, and maps the accessibility metadata included in EPUB, both Dublin Core and Schema.org, um, to Onyx Onyx's Onyx's list 196. Um, I will I will never try to use uh, an S after Onyx again. Uh, so uh, it has two columns uh, on the, the left at the beginning is the EPUB column, which are the largely the um, Dublin core terms. And on the right are the list 196 terms. And this includes things like certified by certifier report. So if you do have a, if somebody has told you that your EPUB is certified to be accessible, like Benetech's Global Certified Accessible Program, um, that's where you would include that information. And what follows is the schema.org and Onyx mapping. Um, so you can see the different accessibility features as well as the different Onyx list 196 features. Um, there are other maps that are available as well. Um, I um, provided a link to one of them in the slide. Um, this was an independent effort um, and I can share what it looks like when you download it. Um, so this is a map uh, that covers a much larger frame of resources. So um, it maps accessibility metadata across schema.org, Onyx, Mark 21, and BibFrame. Uh, and you can, um, the alignment to each of the types comes together across the grid. Um, both of these resources are free and open, uh, which means that as you get a grip on one set of accessibility metadata for your titles, it's much easier to make sure that you're providing a more robust set across all of the different frameworks. Uh, Rachel, we had a, a question in the chat that uh, might be good to talk to at this moment, which is uh, uh, explaining Dublin Core. We didn't have it in the in the short list. It's true. Um, so I can, I can give kind of a brief overview of what Dublin Core is. It is its own set of metadata elements. Um, it's called the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. Um, and the goal there is just to, um, uh, to support uh, content with metadata best practices. Um, and so it covers a really, really broad range of content, but I can, um, I will happily provide a link to the Dublin Core um, page so that our, whoop, it doesn't help if I just send it to the panelists so that our um, attendees can read up and get more information. And we had a suggestion that the, the two links that you have uh, open here um, the, for the crosswalk and uh, the accessibility metadata map, perhaps just add those to the chat. Um, you might have to drop out of the presentation for a moment. Um, but uh, we can do that quickly. These are the two metadata maps. Great, those are two different links that they, the... Thanks, Rachel. All right. Uh, so... Um, we did want to talk a little bit about how publishers are actually providing this accessibility metadata. Um, most publishers have a pretty unique workflow um, for providing metadata. And, um, who provides it, who manages it, and updates it, it's all going to vary in role from one house to another. 
Um, I have a sample workflow on this slide. It's, it's a way that this can be done, but it's certainly not the way. Uh, this workflow begins with metadata being entered into a database for management. The metadata covers a really wide variety of information. It's not just about accessibility, it has tax codes, it has um, item descriptions for a print book, it has price and discount codes, a ton of information. Um, there are um, any number of metadata management products that um, can handle this information. Um, I've listed two here. Um, so it includes Clopatech and KNK. It's certainly not limited to those two. Um, and while metadata is managed there, it has to be pushed to content distributors. So the bibliographic metadata is fed into an Onyx transmission database uh, like NetRead or Firebrand. Um, for this house, a standard set of accessibility metadata is applied to all of the titles. And rather than house it in the database, they're actually housing it, they're actually inserting it into the bibliographic metadata that's going into the Onyx transmission feed. Um, so from there, the metadata for this house either feeds to core source to go to channel partners, or it goes directly to channel partners. Um, there's an alternative workflow that's in this as well. Um, there are some channel partners that aren't yet using data transmission feeds. So um, there are manual delivery methods that can be used uh, where a spreadsheet is given to the channel partner to accept the metadata. And one, one thing I think that's worth pointing out <clears throat> on that diagram, Rachel, is that uh, I, you've kind of put in some, some companies that are doing business in this space. But there is overlap. So Firebrand, for example, does uh, provides to title management uh, a database that a, a publisher might use to store as well as, um, and they also provide the transmission services. So is, this this isn't intended to kind of show the vendor map. It's really to show yeah. the, the fundamental activities. Uh, so when Macmillan was trying to tackle this problem, um, and we have just begun to include accessibility metadata in our Onyx feeds and are about six months into the integration, um, we started by considering what our area of focus was. Um, so Onyx 2.1 versus Onyx 3.0 was a major part of that consideration since not all of the North American retailers have begun to accept Onyx 3. Um, since Amazon is making that shift now, we knew it would become a higher priority though. Uh, ultimately, we decided to pull list 196 into a spreadsheet. Um, we included columns for whether the metadata element existed in 2.1 um, and 3.0. Um, and then a description of the metadata element along with any notes associated with the description. So the notes covered like why the, what the metadata element refers to and also why it's important. Um, and then we started ranking them by priority. Um, the highest priority items that we went with were those that were in 2.1 and 3.0. And this way we knew that we could apply it consistently across the market as the market transitioned to 3.0. Um, uh, it was metadata that we knew was standard in our books that it didn't change from one title to another so that we didn't have to worry about any variations. Um, and then it was also what we knew would provide the most information to the widest range of customers. Uh, I have a, a sample from the top of the spreadsheet that's here uh, with the columns I just described. Um, and um, an example of a description is EPUB Accessibility Specification 1.0 AA. And the notes include conforms with the requirements of EPUB Accessibility Spec 1.0 and WCAG level AA um, may carry a URL linking to compliance report or certification. So this gives you all of this like background information. Um, for us, uh, what I included in our in our notes field was that we have the Global Certified Accessible Stamp Benetech, um, so that would be the certifier for our work. Yeah, Rachel. I think. Rachel, oh, sorry, Brian. Oh, go no, ahead. go ahead. You you first, Aaron. 
Uh, yeah, you know, and, and what's really helpful, other than knowing that McMillan is providing this information, is working towards that uh, that UX guide that we all worked on together, which is linked in, in my case study. So um, I encourage folks to check that out as well, because th that's really what we will display out of the metadata and, and, and you know, not just us, other platforms as well. Um, so, you know, having a focus on that is really helpful for us and then letting us know, you know, what, what again, to Brian's point earlier, what takes precedent, you know, Onyx or Schema. I'm excited about that. Yeah. Brian, what were you going to say? I was going to say that there was a question a little bit earlier that was added to the chat, and I, I think Jillian took a look at it. But Kathy Kilo is asking if um, an EPUB file meets the uh, EPUB accessibility spec 1.0 and WCAG level AA <clears throat> standards. Is it enough to use Code 03 from Onyx Plus 196, or do you need to add more accessible metadata? I know it's kind of a deep dive, but it seems like, given that we're talking about how you mapped. Um, and Jillian, did you want to weigh in on that? Um, yeah, great. Uh, it's a good question because in theory, if it meets AA WCAG standards, like two thumbs up. Um, but it doesn't tell you like what accessibility features are included because you could have a um, all text novel um, that you know, is WCAG AA compliant, and you can also have a complex textbook with accessible math and interactive media that is also WCAG AA compliant, but it doesn't tell someone who, whether there is, um, you know, are there, is there video, is there accessible math, is there a table of contents? And actually Rachel's um, putting up the code list here. Um, I don't know if you can make it any bigger on the screen Oh, is it, is it very small? Let me it's try. very small. Um, but the benefits of these other metadata fields are essentially highlighting what is actually in there because it's a, it's a big bucket <laughs> of, of stuff. Um, so like the table of contents navigation, index navigation, the more complex um, content you have, the more critical it is that, that these elements are, are called out. So Rachel, I don't know if there's any, anything else you'd like to add to to that. No, that's great. I mean, um, providing the, the overall level of specification is certainly helpful to users, but the more detailed information you can provide, the more they understand what they can actually use within the content. And some of these extend beyond the basic certification levels. So providing synchronized pre-recorded audio is not something that falls under A or AA for a, a book content, but at the same time, if you're providing it, it could provide a much better experience for some users. And I just wanted to, we hadn't called this out, but what you've done is navigated to the editor, the resource at editor.org um, that shows the, the specific code list for, in this case, uh, update issue 53 is uh, the most recent update, so. Uh, and I've, I've provided <laughs> link in the chat. Um, let me just go back to presenting. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, we took the list of high priority items that came up and we checked with channel partners about what they would accept. And for the most part, we heard that we can send it, um, but they won't always know what to do with it. Um, this points to a chicken egg, and egg problem that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but the accessibility metadata was then integrated into what we call our metadata deep dive, um, which is a map of all of the metadata profiles that we provide as a company. Um, and then we released it and tested 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 it uh, to make sure that it actually worked and we weren't breaking anything. Um, and we communicated what we were sending to each of the channel partners that was meant to receive it. Um, after this was done, we started providing what we had ranked as our high, after we were done providing what we had ranked as our highest priority metadata, we kind of went back to the drawing board. Um, we looked at metadata that came um, as sort of like the level two priority. Um, and now we're, we're looking at the process of integrating that as well. Um, so recipient and recipients that are looking to integrate any of this metadata from publishers can really benefit from that testing relationship back and forth. Uh, we do have another poll question for all of you. Uh, this is uh, whether you 
uh, are accepting accessible metadata. Brian, can you bring that up? Yeah, and as I launch it, maybe Aaron, you have a perspective on the <clears throat> the importance of of essentially uh, doing this kind of mapping and uh, and the work that McMillan has done. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it's it's very helpful for us to know if you're providing it, um, which ways that you're providing it and, and having a, you know, a map like that only helps us to understand how to store it and how to surface it. Um, you know, you're kind of in the dark if you, if you're just sort of, you know, processing all the titles, but not looking for the right things. Um, so, you know, it's really helpful to, to actually reach out to the partner, talk to them, uh, and just have an understanding of, of how it's going to be displayed and what to provide. And then now I'm answering the poll. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> uh, Brian, you're on mute. I was just saying, Aaron gets to say yes. <laughs> um, so uh, I think we've got the answers that we need and I'll, I'll share the results here. Um, <clears throat> and this is part of the gap that we're hoping to begin to address with conversations that are already underway in the workflow committee, as well as with webinars like this one which is that there is uh, at least a sense that I think we saw something like a third of those were uh, publishers were, were <clears throat> providing metadata about accessible features and products, but really you see less than a quarter, uh, something close to a fifth of, of, um, of them are saying that their partners are uh, accepting it. So that's a gap that we need to close. We'd love to have both more metadata provided and more metadata displayed. So. So. Um, so now that we have an understanding of how metadata works from the publisher perspective, Brian, can you walk us through how metadata moves across the supply chain? Sure. Um, I think one of the things that this, this diagram is actually borrowed from uh, work that BISG did in 2012 initially to kind of look at the overall um, supply chain for metadata in the US market. <clears throat> <clears throat> and you know the uh, I think one of the things that you see is that it, um, there are critical roles in terms of creating and managing metadata for both publishers as well as digital content services. And we don't really think about it uh, at the time that this initial diagram was built. Uh, digital had grown from a kind of a rounding error in, in the mid two thousands to something in the range of fifteen to eighteen percent of the market. And it, it now might be. A little bit higher, a little bit lower, depending on which publisher you talk to. Uh, but it had grown really quickly, and there were a number of, for example, content converters that were taking um, and creating a, a digital files, typically EPUB. Um, those those organizations were also, in some cases, tasked with creating the metadata that described the product, um, and they were doing it kind of outside of that uh, workflow that had been set up for physical products and had in many cases been fine-tuned over a generation. Um, the second piece of it is that <clears throat> it's really clear, clear that what distributors, aggregators, and retailers do and what they accept it really governs what gets seen. Um, so that if, if the metadata is conveyed to a distributor uh, or a retailer and they don't accept it or they don't accept and display it, um, the information that a consumer needs about a given product, including information about accessibility, uh, is hard to, to keep up. Um, the, the third thing is that there are um, multiple ways that you're going to find out about content. It's not just uh, go, to, go to the particular retailer, go to a college bookstore, um, lots of different venues to be able to find out. And people tend to, to turn to the internet or some version of the internet to be able to find out information quickly and effectively, whether they're doing it through an online retailer or just simply discovering it through SEO. And I think that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's an important piece of the puzzle too, because we increasingly have to be thinking about people finding information about books uh, outside of the traditional supply chains that exist. Um, and then the last piece, and, and this is important as you start to think about um, very granular descriptions of content, uh, the chances of a feed being changed um, uh, across the supply chain are actually not small. And so there has to be some mechanism for you to periodically check to make sure that the information you've put out about a book reflects the, um, what, what you feel to be accurate. Because if uh, so, any one of the intermediaries changes the feed or changes aspects of it, 
uh, you could be describing the product in a retail environment in a way that doesn't reflect what you what a publisher might want. Uh, and Brian, Judith had asked a question. Um, by accepting metadata, do you mean making it available to end users? Well, it's actually that's a two step process uh, and I'm sure Aaron could weigh in on this as well, but uh, there's both accepting the metadata you essentially not deleting it from the feed, but you might just store it and not display it. You may not have the uh, capability to display it or you may choose not to, to display it and, and Rachel I think you talked a few minutes ago or, or perhaps um, Julian did about uh, the reading platforms tend not to feature uh, the metadata metadata about fe features that uh, they don't support. So they could accept the metadata, but simply just deactivate it saying, well, that's not something we, we can do on this device. So we're not gonna tell people it's there. Yeah, that, that's where that uh, UX guide is so critical. Um, you know, for those of us who all worked on that and agreed that, you know, these are the things that we support and these are the things that we're looking for. Um, I, I think that, you know, that's important. There'll be cases where maybe we might just say it's not provided or we don't know whether it's supported because it wasn't provided, even though we support it, you know? So it, it definitely is, is crucial for us to convey the right information to the user that way. Excellent. Yeah, I think the assumption that if you provided it, it that's enough, uh, we would have to challenge. Mm -hmm. we, that more has to be done. Yeah. Uh, so, Aaron, do you want to talk to us about um, yeah. what your partners do with it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, first and foremost, you have to create it and, and get it to us, right? Um, you know, we, we, we rely on, um, on, you know, what you provide to us. I mean, we, we're not obviously going to make anything up, uh, but, you know, being able to, to add it and let us know that you're adding it. Um, you know, are you only doing it moving forward with new titles? Are you going backwards and doing it in your backlist? That sort of thing. Um, because think about it, we have millions of titles in our catalog. So we, it's really important for us to understand back to that point of working together and, you know, where, where are you putting it and, and where should we be pulling it from and displaying it? And, um, you know, having conversations about what does your reading system support, at least from our end. So, you know, you know, being involved in all of these, the, with these other groups and, and all of us staying on par with what we are offering for accessibility support is really important. Um, and our publishers knowing what you can do in our e-reader is important for them to know how their books should be, you know, formatted the information that could come across. Um, and we'd mentioned before that you, obviously you can ha have this come across in both ways, uh, but knowing which you would prefer to take precedence um, is important because that was a rabbit hole that we went down for quite a while, like arguing back and forth. Like, so is um, Onyx better because it seems like more deliberate or um, is the EPUB metadata be better because it seems more current? Or is there the potential there that you've actually used some sort of a template and maybe the metadata isn't right? Um, you know, there's no real way for us to validate what's right and what's wrong. So uh, that's, that's another great thing that we, we need to really lean heavily on the publishers for. Uh, Brian, yeah. can you talk a little bit about the recipient summit? Sure. So in earlier this year in February, we held a uh, uh, nearly a day long uh, recipient summit where we uh, talked about several different topics, including accessibility metadata. And what we heard from the, the recipients who were uh, part of the conversation was that there was really strong interest uh, in good data uh, and trying to resolve some of the problems that Aaron uh, just described. Um, and some of those problems are within the control of publishers. Uh, if um, for example, if uh, third parties, uh, con contracted resources are creating EPUB files and adding schema.org type data, they're often cribbing it from something else. Uh, and that could be a print product, which means it's not going to have the, um, the accessibility metadata that you would want to add for um, uh, a digital product. Um, Similarly, if Onyx or Books isn't built with accessibility in mind, if the metadata is not created that way, you're, you're gonna create problems. There was also a real interest in integrating marketing and production data <clears throat> that this kind of goes back to um, the, uh, the question of how do you use the Onyx or Books right now? And 
do you have good uh, people who are not production in this case being you know knowledge of the accessibility features versus marketing which is uh, often the, the the part of onyx that gets the most attention and both of those need to be done well um, there was a, a brief discussion about the role of the library community and um, the import the importance of hearing from end users who are not just the individual consumers, but uh, who have a really strong interest in providing resources to their users that are um, that meet their needs. And, if, and there's a feeling that we could do more in that regard. Uh, one of the nice things about <clears throat> working at BISG is that our, our membership does include libraries and we have representation both in committees and on the board. And there was also a, a mention of, at least in the, in the EU, of mandates that are going to go into effect in the next uh, three or four years. Um, there is also a similar movement in Canada, and there are higher education mandates and some uh, K-12 mandates in the U.S. market, all of which uh, are going to put additional pressure on publishers and the supply chain to be able to describe and, um, and market accessible products. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to take a, a look at some specific examples of metadata usage and its impact. I mentioned before that there is the chicken and egg problem, and we've uh, we've talked about that quite a bit. Uh, but what we hear a lot from distributors is that they haven't started doing anything with accessibility metadata uh, because most publishers aren't providing it. And publishers, on the other hand, have no interest in investing in updating their metadata data feeds. Um, with accessibility information because they feel that most distributors aren't exposing it in a meaningful way. Um, the numbers are sort of creeping up on both sides for, for, for each participating in that exchange of information. But ultimately, the success of this metadata really depends on agreement from both sides that implementation is important. Uh, so we have two examples of where that, that work has taken place. Uh, one is for Macmillan Learning, um, and then the other because, well, Macmillan Learning, because I know you all want to hear me talk more, um, and then the other one is for Marin Lucas at Red Shelf, um, because wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to hear my voice anymore? Um, so starting with Macmillan Learning, um, as a higher education company, Macmillan routinely gets requests from schools for alternative versions of textbooks for users with print disabilities. So the traditional workflow for students is they purchase a copy of the book, it's often print um, that the student can't use. And then they bring that copy or receipt or some sort of proof of purchase to their support office at school. So this would be the, the disability support office, the DSO or the accessibility support office or some variation on that. Um, when the proof of purchase is provided, the support office contacts the publisher to request an accessible alternative. Um, and that request could be direct. It could be reaching out to the publisher's customer service. It could be a sales representative. It could be an accessibility contact page, um, or it could be indirect. So they could be reaching out to a resource like Access Text Network or Bookshare. Um, and the publishers respond in a variety of ways. Uh, most often, these responses involve releasing a less secure version of their texts and a version that does not actually receive the same updates that the ebooks that are hosted by channel partners receive. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Macmillan is providing both Onyx accessibility metadata and schema.org metadata. The Onyx accessibility metadata is fairly new for us, um, but schema.org metadata has been provided as a part of our EPUB packages for a while. Um, in 2019, when we became a global certified accessible publisher, our schema.org metadata um, was much more robust within the EPUB in order to align with those certification guidelines. Um, that metadata is exposed uh, in some retailers, including Vital Source, which I've uh, included some screenshots up here. And that includes a summary of the important aspects of the metadata program and a full list of the metadata that's provided. Um, so in 2019, we were working on integrating this robust schema um, metadata into our ebooks. And at that point, we were receiving um, a little more than 2,400 accessibility requests in a year. Uh, in 2020, after the robust metadata had been applied across more than half of our titles, those requests went down to 1,200. Um, 
2021, we're still measuring year to date, but we're seeing even fewer titles, even fewer requests. And I, I can back up those numbers because I would say Macmillan is the publisher we get the least number of accommodation requests from on the red shelf side. I am always happy to give that. <laughs> um, so Erin, can you tell us a little bit about what red shelf's been doing? I certainly can. Um, so um, just kind of maybe backing up a little bit uh, pre um, uh, metadata. Uh, our goal has always been to help campus stakeholders, you know, make the most accessible decisions when it comes to course materials. Um, so we really started evangelizing the benefits of that whole idea of born accessible and EPUB, right? Gen better user experience in general, uh, more assistive technology friendly, less accommodation requests, like uh, like Rachel was saying. So even pre metadata, you know, we started to see less um, requests for accommodations as more and more publishers got on board with creating EPUB. Um, and then this becomes even more crucial now. Uh, because so many DSOs have been downsized and, um, you know, they're doing the work of multiple people now post COVID. Um, so, you know, obviously we continue to push um, this piece of the puzzle. Um, and then it also empowers those students who choose not to register with the DSO. Um, you know, if they, if they don't feel like they need to self identify their, their content is still usable. So, you know, that was a good start, but next slide. Right. <laughs> Um, you know, it's not really enough to just know the format of the book, right? So we were really pushing EPUBs and saying, hey, you know, when you look at our catalog, you can see, is it an EPUB? Is it a PDF? You know, make your decision from there. Um, and, and, you know, that helped for a while. It sort of helped us get over the hump of we have more EPUBs in our catalog than we have PDF. And the availability of EPUB on our side has gone up 40% since 2017. So that was significantly successful. But then when you look at the flip side of that coin, though, what's actually being adopted and distributed to students um, was always the kind of, the, again, the flip side of that. So while we are now adopting 46% EPUBs over PDF, um, that number was significantly lower in 2017, and that's gone up 209% since 2017. So we're winning in the EPUB game, feels like, um, but not all EPUB is created equal. Next slide. So that's where accessibility metadata comes in. And so we like to think of accessibility metadata as like a superhero of digital textbooks. Um, you know, it's kind of hidden in plain sight. Uh, maybe you need like, uh, you know, to, to run into a phone booth real quick and, and, you know, change into the superhero that metadata can be. But we really just needed to unmask it and we needed help to get it unmasked to figure out, okay, so we have this data, we're pulling it. What do we do with it? What, what do the publishers want to see? What does industry want to see in terms of display? So that's why, like I had mentioned previously, a bunch of us got together like Daisy and BISG, Benetech, Rachel at McMillan, um, um, Red Shelf, of course, and Vital Source. We all work together to create a user friendly standard for revealing this accessibility metadata to the world. Um, so, you know, we thought that that was really crucial because without some kind of a, a standard, you could just literally display either everything or anything or just display the tags, which are super not helpful for people. Um, you know, you, you might not know what any of them means and that, that sort of defeats the purpose, right? Um, so um, uh, next slide. So again, back to that chicken and egg dilemma, we were, we were struggling with, you know, how do we know who's providing the metadata? Um, you know, when we first took a shot at it, uh, we were, you know, looking at both the schema and the Onyx metadata, and we were sort of, you know, in a position where we were moving to the Onyx 3, 3.0, and so we started, like, looking for it in Onyx. And even though it seems like more publishers were providing it that way, we just weren't finding it. Um, it wasn't coming through to us. So whether that was, it was already in titles that weren't necessarily going through that processing step again, um, or just happened to be publishers that weren't doing it that way, or, you know, we weren't really sure. So again, kind of in the dark there. Um, and then, you know, we had to, to look at, all right, do we need to update our processing step when it comes to EPUB to pull that metadata out? 
Um, well, obviously we did incorporate that so we can pull that out of EPUB and it was kind of already there. We just weren't really doing anything with it and moving it through the pipeline on our end to get it from the point of being in, in the EPUB, in the e-reader and getting it into like e-commerce or white labels, et cetera. Um, so we did, we did make that uh, update but really also kind of like a needle in a haystack. So for example, let's say Rachel says XYZ ISBN has metadata, but it hasn't gone through processing recently or hasn't gone through processing since we started pulling it out, it doesn't show up. And then we're all just like scratching our heads, like Rachel said it's there, why isn't it there? Um, and so, you know, you, you, you really have to, again, back to that whole idea of the partners working together uh, to make sure that everybody's on the same page um, and, and being able to have that back and forth to say, hey, you know, could you throw that file over to us again and we'll reprocess it. So, um, you know, we we sort of made the, the decision that, you know, the, the EPUB seems to have more information, at least for us so far, we seem to be getting better data that way. Again, though, you know, if, if that's not the case, for um, your products, if you feel like Onyx is more accurate, then that's something that we should know. So these are conversations that we're having on the accessibility side and the processing side with like our publishing team to, to talk to our partners and say, you know, why don't we get together and, and have this discussion. Um, but then what we really realized is once publishers start getting certified workflows, that was really the rescue point for us because we we're able to say, okay, they are saying it's there. Someone else is saying their workflow is certified. It has to be there. So uh, we worked with McMillan and Guilford Press because they were both certified at the time that we started this project um, to say, hey, give us some ISBNs. We will you know, reprocess them and pull the data out. Next slide. So essentially, you know, we were able to then display this, this accessibility metadata, uh, you know, the, the key points within that UX guide, as well as, you know, having a way for someone to see all of the metadata. And like, if you really like metadata and tags, you can geek out and just like read all the tags. Um, but, you know, you don't necessarily have to. Um, and, and then, of course, in the case where uh, in, in this particular instance, it's a, a PDF of the year in the life of William Shakespeare. So it does not have any metadata in it. So we also indicate there's no metadata available for this title. Uh, one of the things that we do kind of struggle with, though, is um, if we're talking about that guide for displaying metadata and the standards around that. Um, if it's something that a publisher doesn't provide, do we want to say um, the publisher didn't provide this or do we just want to leave it empty? Um, it, you know, I, I think that's, again, that conversation that you have to have that back and forth um, you know, we, we don't necessarily want to just leave it off the list to sort of indicate that it doesn't exist. But at the same time, you don't want to be calling out your publishing partners and saying, well, they didn't give us that information. So it's not there. Uh, next slide. So uh, in 2021, I declared from my house, <laughs> not in the office, that uh, 2021 uh, would be the uh, red shelf, the age of metadata. So this is what we were focusing on the entire year uh, on the accessibility side, and I'm just forcing all of my colleagues to go along with me for the ride. Um, this summer, what we are doing is going on kind of a mining expedition. So, you know, it's, it's fairly expensive and time consuming to reprocess our existing catalog, but we are working on doing that sort of working backwards newer titles um, and pulling out as much debt metadata as we can. So both Onyx and EPUB, we did our own crosswalk. We, you know, all, we've got all of that documented on our side as well. And then any new titles that come through will automatically have any metadata that's included exposed. And in cases where, like I mentioned, if we know that it should be there, for some reason it's not appearing, you know, we'll get in touch with the publisher and request updated files. And then uh, sort of like Michael had mentioned in the chat, we are gonna work with Benetech to create a library of certified titles that we can display as, you know, one of the automatic filters that happens uh, in Ecom. And then also in Ecom, some additional filters for metadata, as well as providing that in the white label experience. Because if you have a school that's white labeled, they're going to want to search that as well, not necessarily come to redshelf.com to find it. So 
Beyond 2021 uh, is metadata to SQL. So we want to take that metadata and not just expose it to the consumer side, but also expose it to the campus side and also give indications to publishing partners like, okay, you, we're, we're providing this, but maybe you're missing like these key things. Did you know that you were missing them? So different ways to use that metadata that, to not only benefit the customer, but to benefit our partners as well. And I think that's my last one. Great. Over to you, Brian. We wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit and just say what, what are the key takeaways uh, and then use that as the basis for a discussion, at least among the panelists. We have a, a several questions that I'm sure we'd love to get to. But I, I think that this kind of summarizes where we are. <clears throat> the first part is that if you're going to create high quality metadata, and that, this is true for more than just accessibility, but certainly for accessible for describing accessible products, uh, workflows matter. And we've created a, a document that actually came out of this committee, I believe in uh, uh, the fall of 2019 called Fixing the Flux. It's essentially a best practice guide for uh, implementing good workflows. Um, but it certainly as well, the, the, the approaches that Rachel has described that they put in place at Macmillan, fairly granular at the start, uh, to form a consensus about what is it that we want to, what information do we want to provide and how are we going to get that, where, where are we going to source it and then how are we going to convey it? Those questions are, are really workflow questions and it's important that they be done well and planned for. Um, thank you, Rachel, for adding that link. Um, the second piece is that metadata quality is really critical. Uh, it's important ideally to have both uh, the schema.org and uh, Onyx uh, files uh, to match and not to put uh, recipients uh, in the position of trying to decide which descriptions are accurate or complete. Um, but uh, that also is a function of workflow. If you've got a, if you set up to generate high quality metadata, um, then the, the outgrowth, the output of that is really important. Um, there are, there are companies that can help you with that. Some of the ones that uh, Rachel was mentioning earlier are good examples, but there are more. And it's, uh, it's, it's useful too, to be thinking about it. We have a question actually about how to put in place good metadata workflows. And we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, it's important to have relationships with trading partners that are going to accept and process. Uh, and both steps are important. The metadata that you send, I mean, they have to be able to use it uh, and, and creating a partnership with those trading uh, partners is really important. Uh, it's they, in many cases they have to make changes to their own systems, uh, and uh, to and, and probably to both, both to accept and to, and to display, um, and that's a, a critical piece of the puzzle. So finding ways to engage them, test, and come up with a scheme that works for both sides of the equation is important. And then I think that ultimately we we see this as an opportunity to grow the market. We don't. Uh, while it's important to address the needs of uh, uh, a print di disabled or an, uh, an accessible uh, audience, it's, it's also an opportunity for publishers to sell more books, to sell more uh, content in the marketplace and to make it possible for people who otherwise can't or, or have difficulty engaging with print products to find other solutions. Uh, and this could be at, at some point a mandate in many markets, uh, but that's not really what's motivating us. We think that this is an opportunity to do a good thing and to, to benefit uh, both the, the customers as well as uh, the industry by selling more books. Um, so we have, um, I, I wanted to ask a, a few questions if I might and, uh, and then we can go to a poll if, if, um, when we finish that. Um, one, a few things are just mechanical. Um, Rachel, I think you talked about Access Text Network and Bookshare. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you could explain ATN and uh, um, Jillian to talk a little bit about what Bookshare is. Uh, yeah, so Access Text Network is a repository of uh, publisher materials. It's run out of um, Georgia Tech, yes? Yep. Like? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's, I, I need Aaron to keep me honest. Um, <laughs> uh, so publishers can provide their um, uh, accessible files um, or their book files 
to Access Text Network as a repository, at which point uh, schools can then access, only in higher ed, um, but schools can access um, the files there and send requests to the publishers to either um, open up those files to use for a student or um, to post new files for a student. So we see um, tons of requests come through Access Text Network every day from member universities. Um, in some cases, those are for EPUB, sometimes it's PDF, sometimes it's Word. Uh, it all depends on what the student's preference is, but uh, we're able to, to assist students uh, directly through that, that contact. And then Julian, can you talk about Bookshare? Yeah, so um, Bookshare is an ebook library of accessible books. Um, we operate under a copyright exception that allows us to create accessible materials for those people with print disabilities. Um, all members who access the access the Bookshare library have to have a proof of disability um, in order to access any of the content on the site. And we work very closely with um, over 900 different publishers um, who donate ebook content, uh, which we then use our technology going going back to a uh, um, Brian's description of Benetech technology for social good. So what we do is we convert um, publisher provided EPUB files and convert them into a number of different accessible formats uh, that allow users to um, essentially read the way that they need on a variety of accessible technology devices from digital braille, uh, screen reader, um, audio, um, using uh, computer, computer text-to-speech voices, um, and the end. And um, just to add real quick, because I know uh, Rachel was talking about um, working directly with schools. So um, Bookshare also gets a lot of funding through the Department of Education. So any student in the US gets access for free. Um, and so many students use Bookshare as an additional resource for, um, for accessing their school content. But we are not limited to students only. Thank you. Um, there's an observation in the chat. We have uh, four, at least four questions that I want to make sure I post to you. But there's an observation from Charles Lapierre with Benetech um, on the West Coast. And um, just talking about the, uh, I guess we being Benetech is working with others in the W3C publishing community group to help improve accessibility metadata and how to expose this metadata and standardize the process for adding new accessibility metadata values. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that that's a good initiative within the W3C. Part of the concern that BISG has is that a, a significant amount of information about products is conveyed using Onyx. So anything that's developed for the W3C has to essentially also be updated in Onyx, or we're going to have the kind of disconnects that Aaron was uh, alluding to. Uh, that's yeah. not that's not Charles' responsibility, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's something we regularly try to come back to the W3C and say, which is, you know, remember that we have to sell books, and and how we sell books fundamentally is is conveyed through Onyx. Um, so one of the questions, the first one, going back to relatively early in our our conversation, was from Ram, who said, uh, as a beginner, can you please tell me how to be a metadata expert? Uh, from where to start and what are the technical aspects? And I, I don't think we can answer that question in full today, um, but, <laughs> but I will say that um, BISG has um, uh, a resource. Uh, let me see if I can share this quickly. Um, no, I'd rather not because it'll take us out of our presentation, but I'll send a link in the chat to our best practices guide for metadata. This is for both senders and receivers in the North American market, so the US and Canada. Uh, we, it was developed jointly with BookNet Canada, our partner uh, in, based in Toronto. But it's kind of the nuts and bolts of how metadata works field by field and, core, and code list value by code list value. Um, it hasn't, uh, it's, it's relatively up to date. Uh, we haven't updated it to focus only on Onyx 3, although that's in the work for the second half of this year, but it's a good place to take a look and start. And if you are based in North America and certainly in the US, I would consider joining BISG if you wanna learn more about it, uh, write to us at info at BISG.org and we'll give you some information about what it would take to join. And certainly we'd be glad to, to test, you give you a test drive to come to some of our metadata committee or other committee meetings and um, uh, and then um, 
see if that's a good fit for you. Um, the the only other thing I'd add is that there are um, uh, really important vendors in this space who provide metadata solutions, and a big piece of what they do is also help uh, their customers understand best practice, as both in outlined in the guide and uh, learn from uh, other customers. They often have uh, community groups or or community forums that allow. Uh, their customers to talk to one another. So if you're thinking of investing in a system, um, talk to the vendors and it'll, it'll get you uh, um, that kind of visibility. Um, second question we had was uh, from uh, Robbie. He's actually got a couple of different questions. Um, just uh, there was a, a question about initiatives to help synchronize or adapt metadata that exists within content packages. So schema.org inside EPUB. Uh, and compared to what's sent externally to metadata. Um, I haven't seen any efforts uh, to, to automatically synchronize those. Um, manually, of course, there's, there are the crosswalks, uh, which is largely what we've been relying on in order to do that work. But um, if I see Jillian and, uh, and Aaron nodding, so I suspect that, that they're in the same boat. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I do think it's an awesome idea, though. Um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, Charles uh, uh, added uh, after it said, uh, responded to his observation that they're working with both schema.org and Onyx. One thing I might suggest that might not be apparent within um, is that the BISG is responsible for communicating US based um, feedback around Onyx to editor. And so if there are um, opportunities to either uh, bring a, a message to or put pressure on editor to, um, to take up a particular initiative, even though the W3C's efforts are not specific to the US market, uh, we're a fairly big implementation of Onyx. So they, they tend to listen to us. Uh, not always, but sometimes. Uh, Robbie also asked, what's the biggest stumbling block toward automated reprocessing? Um, uh, as both sides of the equation, publishers and recipients get better at providing metadata. Yeah, are there IT and infrastructure limitations that haven't been addressed? And I, I think the answer there is, yeah. I mean, that, that probably is the biggest roadblock. I mean, on our side, um, the, the issue that we hit was, um, did we wanna make the investment in systems updates for metadata that wasn't necessarily gonna go somewhere? Um, and that was a difficult sell. Um, to, to say, okay, well, you know, again, chicken and egg argument, um, but we want to be first. So we want to be, be able to put that information out there and know that when somebody is ready to accept it, they will. Um, but that did mean that we had to make changes to our metadata storage. We had to make changes to our metadata streams and that costs money um, and not something that we're necessarily going to see a return on in the immediate future. Um, so yeah, and I would love for it to be easier um, for that sort of update to take place um, and for that, that process to be a little more streamlined. Yeah, that's I think the same that's... on our end. The whole idea of reprocessing an entire catalog. <laughs> the CTO is like, no. <laughs> it was expensive. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and that's why, you know, you kind of have to do it in more of a, so the off season on our side, you know, just going through the whole catalog. And so you, you, timing is everything. Um, yeah. And it, it's not necessarily cheap to, to do that. And so that's why it's so, just so helpful to know, it, you know, like if we had like a giant list of ISBNs, then we could just focus on those, you know, we could script it so that it would just reprocess those titles. Um, yeah. So th that'd be a great thing to, to send over to us. Um, if you know what has metadata and you're not seeing it, we can reprocess it. And, and we do, I, without going um, too far into the weeds, but it, we do we see regularly uh, efforts that we've, of uh, good ideas that we've proposed that kind of break on the shores of, um, of IT budgets, you know, and, and it's really, it's not just money, sometimes it's availability of resources, um, we, we're doing work in the area of rights, where uh, we have a, a taxonomy that we'd love to test. But um, the most active and and vibrant publishers to, to do the work are involved with acquisitions right now, and um, that, that that takes precedence. So it's a real world uh, reality. 
Um, Taylor is asking, um, and this might be good for you, Rachel, if, if, you're, if a publisher just starting to use accessible metadata, what's best practice using both schema and Onyx simultaneously, or do you pick one or the other and try to use that consistently, at least to move forward? Uh, so the reason that I laughed about the accessible, about the metadata expert question is because I am so far from a metadata expert. I, I don't I don't think the distance actually gets greater. Um, but my take on this is that you should do both. And um, we didn't do both initially, and I didn't realize how easy it was to do one after you've done the other. Um, and the, the reason is those crosswalks. So there's, there's so much alignment between them that once you really wrap your head around that, that first set, whether you start with Onyx or you start with Schema, um, and start including that metadata, it is so easy to start mapping across to Onyx and make sure that you're providing that information in that method too. And the, the audience benefit can be different, right? So we see schema.org metadata being exposed some places. We see Onyx metadata helping with search engine optimization. So you can get, um, it's, you're, it's not a redundant effort, um, but the content is, is primarily the same. And I'm just gonna, I'm just now putting, uh, repeating the, um, the two links that you added for the crosswalks yeah. um, that earlier. That crosswalk is, is really amazing because um, it, it covers so many different types of metadata outside of what we talked about here. So if you're looking for library metadata, and, um, there's, there's a significant amount in there. Uh, we have a good cl probably closing question from Tom Richardson at BookNet Canada, but before I do that, I wanted to, uh, give Taylor a follow-up. She noticed in Onyx uh, code list 196 uh, um, that there's a, a value for inaccessible. Um, uh, is anyone want to weigh in on why explicitly stating something is inaccessible has provided benefit to the retailer or the end user? Um, I'll take, I'll take that you. one. Thank you. Um, I think it goes back to if, if, um, a book is not going to be usable for a certain audience, then it's nice to know that from the get go. And basically, you're saving yourself returns. Good point. Yeah. And then the last piece uh, from Tom um, he's asking about more broadly about feedback loops to publishers. You know, what can we do to make them better? Um, you know, for example, uh, uh, somebody might say the alt descriptions are not well written or somebody has a uh, functionality problems, accessibility feature X didn't work well, I was using reader Y. Um, is there a mechanism in place right now? And if not, what might we do to help uh, facilitate that? I will say one of the biggest frustration points on the publisher side is that often when we get feedback about something not working, what we'll hear is the book's not accessible. Um, and while that helps in some degree. We know it's we know it's an accessibility issue. What there is such a broad range of, of areas that could be impacted by this. Um, and when we look at other um, customer service issues, we see things like okay, page um, twenty eight is blank. That's pretty easy for us to to like dive in there and address. So I think that having this like facilitated back and forth is really important. Um, that customers should be reaching out. And one of the things that we're, um, we're comfortable providing within our metadata is contact information so that um, people can reach out to us and say, I, I can't find any alt text on any of your images, but your alt text, your um, metadata says there's a short and long description. Uh, so that's really helpful. But I don't, um, as far as I know, there's no like, um, there's no system that's designed to facilitate that back and forth. Um, and there's no like, um, there's no platform for that conversation to take place aside from just um, reaching out over email. Aaron, and how I about know, from you? Yeah, in our case, yeah, we, we it, you know, we encourage, um, that's one of the reasons why we work so closely with DSOs. You know, if, if they have an issue, they know that they can come to us and uh, we're likely to know who to point them to if it's, if it's not something that we can solve. Um, and, you know, we're always encouraging that kind of back and forth and, and you know, what, with our publishers, we have agreements to say, hey, if we, we some kind of a complaint from the school, we're going to need you to take a look at that, remediate it, and if, if it's an accessibility barrier. 
Um, so I think that's important to know that, you know, if, you, if you're working with someone who, who is delivering your content, then to being comfortable to allow that feedback loop to happen there too. So it sounds like the opportunity there is as you're creating that, that um, partnership um, or in testing that you also talk through, what do we do with feedback? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of other questions. Uh, Lee Nash is just saying that uh, a big barrier for smaller presses uh, is that they use off the shelf solutions like CoreSource, which I, I think Macmillan Learning is also using for distribution. We use that for some of our general um, And just essentially saying we control our schema.org data, but is there anything that we can do to encourage providers to include those fields for us uh, and to add uh, code list 196 as well? Ask. ask. Well, <laughs> asking, um, yeah, I, I mean. Uh, I, uh, part, of, part of what will help move this forward is um, making sure that, that everyone is having these conversations, right? So um, yeah. one of the issues that we had before was that, um, you know, a publisher would see that it wasn't accepted, so a publisher just didn't provide it. Um, and a, a distributor would see that it wasn't provided, and so you know, they would make no effort to accept it. And so um, I think every publisher needs to start diving into this and saying, we, we've done this work, we want to provide this accessibility metadata, you need to start accepting it. Um, and um, it is so much harder for smaller presses um, to, to get that voice heard, um, which is why the bigger presses that are out there really need to help support uh, that, that movement. Yeah, and I'd say Lee adds the comment in the chat that, uh, uh, at least in their instance, they've asked many times and, and it finds it frustrating that we haven't made progress. I think part of the reason we're having this webinar we had the recipient summit in February and we'll continue on this topic, both in committee and, and we'll figure out other ways to surface it is to uh, build a consensus that it, it's worthwhile and that, uh, that it's time has come. So BISG can play a role. If you're already, if you're, if you're part of BISG and you want to join the committee or if you just want to test drive at Lee, please you know, write to us at that earlier address, info at BISG.org. And, um, uh, um that that's uh we'll, we'll figure out what we can do to to engage you because it, it's if you if you're motivated on the topic uh you'd be a big help uh we 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 need we need more voices and we can try and organize them um uh robbie desmond coming back is asking uh just about software platforms uh he, he mentions edr labs thorium as an example um are currently involved in the metadata conversation I don't hear a lot of that. Is am I wrong? Um, I don't know. I um, honestly, I, I think that there is a lot of that um, for browser-based. Uh, not uh, necessarily in the browser-based portion of the conversation, um, but we do have a lot of leading systems that are um, that are sort of participating in that back and forth about the importance of accessibility metadata. And we're seeing that growing. Um, so, I mean, Thorium is a good example. They've made a pretty significant investment in accessibility of their platform. They wanna see accessible, accessible content come into it. And the metadata is the best way to communicate that. Yeah, Absolutely. It's a, it's a useful question, although it's not specific to Thorium because that's EDR Labs, but uh, uh, I'm on the board of uh, Redium. So, uh, uh, perhaps uh, somebody should ask me this question. Uh, it's a good, no, it's an important point. And then the, the last one is uh, Suzanne Norman uh, is with Simon Fraser University, just mentioning that she's hearing that making books accessible is too expensive for small publications. Um, is that something that Rachel or, or um, actually anyone, Jillian as well, uh, would want to weigh in on? Um, I mean, I, I will start. Um, my, my take on accessibility as we have worked through um, updating our content um, for all of, all of what we produce has been that um, if it's something that is worth us producing for anyone, it's worth us producing for everyone. Um, and so rather than um, 
then look at um, how much it's going to cost us to change something in order to make it accessible, we then went to the starting point um, and said, um, how can we build it accessible from the start without having to worry um, about making changes later? And um, that involved um, templatizing a lot of work. We had universal CSSs. We added schema to a lot of the work that we do. We invested in, um, in an authoring system that makes it a lot easier for us to produce this content. And largely, it became about um, you know, making sure that there was a standard in place so that we um, were no longer in the position where we could release something that wasn't meeting those standards. Yeah, far less expensive to, to do it in the beginning than it is in the end. Yeah, agreed. Um, remediation is, is the most expensive part of the process, frankly. But um, there are um, conversion partners like, um, I know Ingram offers a, if, if you work with Core Source and uh, take advantage of their conversion services, they offer um, accessibility additions to um, their title by title features. There's also um, um, vendors that also have um, global certified accessible certification. So they basically can say, you know, if, depending on who you're working with to create your EPUB content, um, they have those, those capabilities as well. And I'm gonna just put a link in the chat to a list of the current um, group of vendors who are GCA certified, which you know includes like Nugent, Amnet, Apex, S4 Carlisle, and a few others. So um, it's definitely not just on the onus of the publisher. You know, if you're not doing stuff in house, that's okay. Um, and then also to the whole expensive part, it also depends. Like, what are you publishing? If you um, tend to publish mostly straight text files. Um, the biggest onus is honestly adding just some of that schema accessibility metadata into them. So it's uh, having a good solid text only EPUB file probably means you're like pretty close to actually being fully accessible. Um, it does get a little bit more complex if you are like uh, the Macmillan learnings of the world and have a lot of um, bells and whistles and kind of more complex layouts. Um, but I'd say that also just depends. Yeah, so there's a wide range depending on what you're what you're producing as well. Yeah, and I, and I think that the, the poll that <clears throat> we've briefly fielded and, and put out there, you can see there's pretty much a, a consensus that there's an opportunity for uh, selling products with better accessibility descriptions. So even if there's an upfront investment, um, the market is there. And Jillian, the, I, as a, father of three redheads. Um, I guess the, the accessible market is huge. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I hear it as well. <laughs> and so the, uh, but more seriously, I, I think there's an opportunity here. And Suzanne uh, responded in part by adding that she'd love to see a primer to provide small pubs with a Q and A. <clears throat> we kind of have a piece of that in the uh, fixing the flux uh, workflow paper, but Maybe in, in an upcoming workflow committee meeting, we can talk about what might be useful to provide as a leave behind of some sort to help. Uh, maybe it's uh, accessibility for the rest of us. Um, we do have uh, a product as well the, uh, um, that is being moved to Daisy, but it's the, uh, the, the cheat sheets and the, accessible, and the accessibility guide that was uh, last updated at the beginning of 2019. So, um, uh, there, there are a couple of different opportunities for us to kind of combine product content and maybe create something that works for a smaller audience, smaller publisher. I also audience. point people to inclusivepublishing.org, which has some great resources. I put the link in the chat. So that's a really important yeah. resource as well. Absolutely. We're not, Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and Laura Brady has, uh, has suggested accessiblepublishing.ca, and I'll make sure that goes out to all the attendees as well. Yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're at time and uh, it's been a long, uh, longer than typical session. So I just want to say thank you to Rachel, Jillian and Aaron. Um, you're kind of three of the four horsemen of the uh, accessibility. And, uh, and you've kept us both focused on this as a topic, but also given us uh, really good examples of how this can work uh, in practice. So thanks for doing this webinar today. And, uh, and, and uh, thank you as well for all the work you do on behalf of the industry.
Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.